I love books. If you've ever been on a coaching call with me, you'll know I have this nice bookshelf on the wall behind me. And because I'm a bit sad when it comes to this sort of thing, I've got them all arranged in height order and in sections by the colour of the cover of the book. Blue section, red section, white section. But behind the slightly OCD arrangements lies some pretty powerful wisdom between those covers. So just for fun, I thought I'd pull off a few of my top favourites down from the shelf, tell you a little bit about them, and then read you one or two of the juiciest snippets from each book. So you can put some of that most important advice to work for you right away without even having to do any reading. Stick around and enjoy. Welcome to the Exam Study Expert podcast, helping you ace your exams at school and university through the psychology of high performance and the science of studying smarter, not harder. It's my pleasure to introduce your host, the Cambridge-trained memory psychologist and exam success coach, William Wadsworth. Yes, hello. Well, I hope you're enjoying our new amped-up intro music. I should say that that's not all that's new here at Exam Study Expert this term slash semester, because you'll also find a brand new cleaning website over at examstudyexpert.com which has been lovingly redesigned from the ground up this year to make it an even more helpful resource to help you study smarter and ace your exams. If you want to check it out, you'll find it at examstudyexpert.com. Enjoy. And so to today's books. I've picked five in total, and I'm going to start with a pair of books by leading memory scientists. You know, these, these are some of the best known psychologists in the world when it comes to studying how we learn, how memory works. First up is a book called Make It Stick uh, by Peter Brown, Mark McDaniel and Professor Henry Rodinger, uh, who is one of the most widely cited psychologists in history. This is an extremely readable guide to the science of learning and how to use it. And to give you a taste of what it's all about, I'm going to read to you from the author's own cliff note summary uh, from the intro. There are some immutable aspects of learning that we can probably all agree on. First, to be useful learning requires memory, so what we've learned is still there later when we need it. Second, we need to keep learning and remembering all our lives. We can't advance through middle school without some mastery of language, arts, maths, science and social studies. Getting ahead at work takes mastery of job skills and difficult colleagues, and even in retirement we pick up new interests. If you're good at learning, you have an advantage in life. Third, learning is an acquired skill, and the most effective strategies are often counterintuitive. You may or may not agree with that last point, but we hope to persuade you of it. Here, more or less unadorned in list form, are some of the principal claims we make in support of our argument. The rest of the book sets them forth more fully, but here's a summary. Learning is deeper and more durable when it's effortful. Learning that's easy is like writing in sand. It's here today, but gone tomorrow. And we're often poor judges of when we are learning well and when we're not. When the going is harder and slower and it doesn't feel productive, we're drawn to strategies that feel more fruitful, unaware that the gains from these strategies are often temporary. They go on to give uh, a number of examples of more effortful and more effective ways to learn. And I'm going to share three of the points that they make. First, rereading text and mass practice of a skill or new knowledge are by far the preferred study strategies of learners of all types, but they're also among the least productive. By mass practice, we mean the single-minded, rapid-fire repetition of something that you're trying to burn into memory, the practice, practice, practice of conventional wisdom. Cramming for exams is an example. Rereading and mass practice give rise to feelings of fluency that are taken to be signs of mastery. But for true mastery or durability, these strategies are largely a waste of time. Point number two. Retrieval practice, on the other hand, which means recalling facts or concepts from memory, is a more effective learning strategy than review by rereading. Flashcards are a simple example. 
Retrieval strengthens the memory and interrupts forgetting. In other words, so you forget more slowly. Information sticks for longer. A simple quiz after rereading a text or hearing a lecture or attending a class produces better learning and remembering than rereading the text or reviewing lecture notes. While the brain is not a muscle that gets stronger with exercise, the neural pathways that make up a body of learning do get stronger when the memory is retrieved and the learning is practised. Periodic practice interrupts forgetting, strengthens retrieval routes, in other words, making it easy for you to remember that information in future, and is essential for hanging on to the knowledge you want to gain. And point number three, many people believe that their intellectual ability is hardwired from birth, and that failure to meet a learning challenge is an indictment of their native ability. But every time you learn something new, you change the brain. It's true that we start life with the gift of our genes, but it's also true that we become capable, through the learning and development of mental models, that enable us to reason, solve and create. In other words, the elements that shape your intellectual abilities lie to a surprising extent within your control. Understanding that this is so enables you to see failure as a badge of effort and a source of useful information, the need to dig deeper or to try a different strategy. The need to understand that when learning is hard, you're doing important work. To understand striving and setbacks, as in any video game or new BMX bike stunt, are essential if you are to surpass your current level of performance and work towards true expertise. Making mistakes and correcting them builds the bridges to advanced learning. So that was Make It Stick. Remember, don't reread your notes but practice retrieval instead. In other words, practice remembering what you know, pulling information out of memory. And be sure to space out your learning over several days and weeks, rather than just cramming it all the night before the exam. And finally, remember that your ability isn't fixed. You can get better at any discipline with the right sort of practice, especially when you're prepared to lean into things that may seem a little bit difficult at first, just as you would if you were trying to build stronger muscles by lifting weights in the gym. As I like to say to my students, be sure to feel the burn when you learn. Okay, book number two. Second on the list is a really lovely book called Understanding How We Learn, written by Jana Weinstein and Megan Samaraki, beautifully illustrated by Oliver Cavaglioni. If Yana's name sounds familiar, it's because she was the star of episode seven of the podcast, and it was a pretty good one too, if you haven't already heard it. The book, Understanding How We Learn, covers many of the same principles as Make It Stick, but it tends to go a little bit deeper into the underlying science and the evidence for why certain things do or don't work. And it's also got some great visuals by Oliver Cavaglioni, who's also going to be coming on the podcast in a few weeks' time uh, to talk about using visuals as part of learning. The extract I've chosen from Understanding How We Learn is taken from the back of the book, where they've got this great summary of takeaways specifically for students. The section I've picked, I think, nicely complements one of the messages we heard in Make It Stick just now, which is all about space learning. And Jana, Megan and Oliver talk about how you can put that principle of space learning into practice. How to plan or space out your work. Spaced practice is the exact opposite of cramming. When you cram, you study for a long, intense period of time close to an exam. When you space your learning, you take that same amount of total study time, but spread it out over a much longer period of time, over subsequent days. Doing it this way, the same amount of study time will produce much longer lasting learning. For example, five hours of study spread out over two weeks produces much better learning than the same five hours on the night before the exam. But spacing your learning requires advanced planning. You can't just decide to space out your learning at the last minute. So how to study with space practice. Start planning early, the beginning of the semester or even earlier. Set aside a little bit of time every day just for studying, even if your exams are months away. Review information from each class, but not immediately after the class. A good way to do this is to reserve some time one day after each of your classes meet. For example, if you have classes on Monday, Wednesday and Friday, you might review the information on Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday, respectively, for each of those classes. 
They've also got a wonderful section called But But Cramming Works, which goes on to say, if you're reading this and you're sceptical because cramming has worked just fine for you in the past, here's why. Cramming can indeed do exactly what it suggests. Cram some of the information into your mind right before an exam. But this isn't a good idea. It may not seem this way, but as a student, you do need to worry about long-term learning. You will need to remember information that you're learning now, later on in your schooling. If you only worry about passing the one test now, you'll have to work double as hard for the next test, even if it's just a few weeks later. And that problem only gets worse and worse as you advance through each semester or term and on into more years of study. In other words, the cramming strategy may get results in the very short term right now, but you'll be making it harder for yourself later on. So there's at least three really big problems with cramming. First, it actually takes up more time because it's less effective. Second, as quickly as you learned that information, you'll then forget it. So you may do fine on the test, but all that extra time you spent during the cramming, it'll have been wasted because you'll forget that information very quickly. And finally, cramming is a bad idea because it inevitably replaces sleep, which is very important for learning and also your mental and physical health generally. So resolve to form a healthy habit today and plan to space your learning. So between Make It Stick and understanding how we learn, we've just had a nice reminder of some of the principles we've talked about right back in episode three of the podcast, which is about using retrieval practice, remembering what you know, and spaced learning. And so do go back to episode three if you want a bit more detail on how to use those strategies. For the next couple of books on my list, I'm going to move away from learning and memory and talk about the thorny issue of getting new behaviours to stick and addressing the issues of mindset and limiting beliefs. Book number three, in my opinion, is a total gem by a gentleman called Professor Timothy Wilson. The book is called Redirect, and it's all about the power of changing the stories our brain tells itself, a technique Timothy calls story editing. As he sets out in the book, there's a ton of evidence for how story editing can lead to very powerful results. Here's one example from his own work, which illustrates exactly the sort of problems story editing can solve and a really powerful way to actually execute story editing in practice. One way to help people change the stories they tell themselves is to spoon feed them a better interpretation of their behaviour. I call this approach story prompting because it involves redirecting people down a particular narrative path with subtle prompts. To understand story prompting, let's take a closer look at two hypothetical college students, Bob and Sarah. Both have just scored a D on a calculus test. Bob's reaction is to skip several classes and study only half-heartedly for the next test. Why try, Bob thinks, when I clearly don't have what it takes? Bob does even worse on the next test, which comes as no surprise to him. After all, he already knows he's not up to the class. He's now caught in a self-defeating cycle. Sarah reacts quite differently after getting a D. I guess the kind of studying I did in high school won't work for this class, she concludes. I need to get in gear for the next test. She attends every class, sits in the front row, and raises her hand to ask questions when she doesn't understand something. Her hard work pays off with an A on the next test. This gives her new confidence in her ability to make it at college, which increases her efforts in other classes. She develops a self-enhancing cycle of thinking, which makes her study harder, improves her grades, and reinforces her belief in the value of studying, leading to further academic success. So how might we nudge students that are thinking a bit like Bob, in other words, thinking, I can't do it, into thinking more like Sarah? In other words, thinking, if I study a bit harder and with a better strategy, I might be able to turn my performance around. To find out, a colleague and I conducted the following experiment. We targeted first-year college students who seemed to be caught in a self-defeating cycle, like Bob, namely those who were not doing as well as they wanted and were worried about their grades. We told them that they would see some of the results from our previous surveys of older students. We showed them videotaped interviews of four upper-class students who conveyed the message about grade improvement, All students reported a steady increase. For example, one student reported getting a 2.0 grade average at first, and then a 2.6, and then a 3.2. 
That was all there was to it. A 30-minute session in which students learned that lots of people struggle academically at first, relatively low grades like the 2.0, but then improve their grades. We figured that the simple message that lots of people struggle at first but do better later might make a light bulb go off in students' heads, triggering the thought, maybe I do just need to learn the ropes and try harder like those other students in the older years that I heard about. In other words, it might have prompted students to think more like Sarah than Bob. The results indicated that the story prompt worked. Compared to a randomly assigned control group of students who didn't get any information about the grade improvements, those who got the story prompt achieved better grades in the following year and were less likely to drop out. These results are particularly dramatic considering how small and seemingly inconsequential the intervention was. After all, it was just a 30-minute psychological experiment in which they were shown some statistics and saw some brief videotapes about other people's grades. Powerful stuff. Uh, and I was pretty impressed when I, I read the book. And if you're curious to learn a bit more, uh, you can, of course, buy the book. Um, but you can also hear more from Tim when he's going to join me on the podcast in a few weeks' time. By the way, if you're noticing a bit of an overlap between guests coming on the show and my favourite books, you wouldn't be entirely wrong. Um, I, I often find that when I finish a book and really like it and think there are some pretty helpful messages that I'd love to share with you all, uh, pretty well the first thing I'll do is drop the author an email and see if I can't get them on the podcast for you. Anyway, we're on the home straight now with my final two picks. Book number four. Rounding out my pair of books that are all about changing your mindset and adopting good new study habits, here's a book called Switch by Chip and Dan Heath. There are plenty of times in your life when you might want to do something differently. Maybe for us here on the Exam Study Expert podcast, it's about adopting a new study routine or perhaps shifting away from rereading your notes to doing more retrieval practice, as Make It Stick would recommend. Changing your behaviour can be tough, but in Switch, Chip and Dan suggest that there are a bunch of simple yet powerful shortcuts to doing that effectively. And I'd agree, that's exactly the kind of work I do with some of my coaching clients when I do one-on-one -on -one coaching with students to help them adopt more effective study methods. So here's an extract which explains uh, one of their ideas, and it's the power of finding what Chip and Dan call bright spots, or examples of times when things are going quite well. And using that as a crowbar to spread that idea that things can go well to other parts of your life where things aren't going quite so well. There's a really good example uh, that they talk about that illustrates the power of doing this. School stinks, said Bobby, a ninth grader who just reported for his first school counselling session. John Murphy, the school psychologist, was surprised Bobby had shown up at all. Several teachers had referred Bobby for counselling, frustrated by his bad behaviour. He was constantly late, rarely did his work, was disruptive in class, and sometimes made loud threats to the other kids in the hallways. Bobby's home life was just as chaotic. He'd been shuffled in and out of foster homes and special facilities for kids with behavioural problems. He and his father were on the waiting list for family counselling. The local social services agency in Covington, Kentucky, was keeping tabs on Bobby. By the time he showed up for his session with Murphy, he was in danger of being placed in another special facility because of his problems at school. Ignoring the school stinks comment, Murphy began talking to Bobby and posed a series of unusual questions. So began the first of a handful of conversations between the psychologist Murphy and the student Bobby. Fast forward to three months later, a dramatic change had occurred. The number of days Bobby was sent to the principal's office had declined by 80%. Bobby, a chronic offender, had now become an occasional offender. And it all happened because of just a few hours talking with a counsellor. So what exactly had happened in those conversations? Here's a brief exchange from one of Bobby's counselling sessions. Notice how Murphy, the school counsellor, starts by asking what uh, Chip and Dan call the exception question. In other words, when was the last time you saw just a little bit of the massive change you want to see, even if just for a short time? The dialogue reads as follows. Murphy, tell me about those times at school when you didn't get into trouble as much. Bobby, I never get into trouble, well, not a lot, in Miss Smith's class. Murphy, what's different about Miss Smith's class? Bobby, 
I don't know, but she's nicer. We get along great. Murphy. Okay, what exactly does that mean? What does she do that's nicer? Murphy wasn't content with Boggy's vague conclusion that Miss Smith is nicer. He kept probing until Bobby had identified several things about Miss Smith and her class that helped him behave well. Miss Smith's class was a bright spot. And any time you have a bright spot, your mission is to clone it. Using Miss Smith's class as a model, Murphy gave Bobby's other teachers practical tips about how to deal with him. I imagine many of you listening uh, to a podcast on how to succeed in your exams probably aren't in quite the same boat as Bobby. But I still think there are useful takeaways in that uh, really fascinating example, uh, no matter what you're wanting to change about how you study, whether that's just trying to incorporate some more retrieval practice uh, and spaced learning into your schedule, or whether you're trying to be more disciplined about the maybe the times you go to bed and get up uh, in the morning. Book number five. Here we go. It's the last one. It's called The Productivity Project. It's an international bestseller by a man called Chris Bailey, who Ted has called the most productive man you could hope to meet. Um, You're going to be hearing much more from Chris because he's going to be my very next guest on the podcast next week. So I'll keep this extract relatively brief. And I'm going to share something from the book that we don't actually talk about very much in the interview itself to avoid overlap again. So here's Chris on tackling procrastination, that uh, problem which plagues so many of us. The science behind why we procrastinate is simple. There are six main task attributes that make procrastination more likely. When a task is boring, frustrating, difficult, unstructured or ambiguous, lacking in personal meaning, and lacking in intrinsic rewards, i.e. it's not fun or engaging. The more of these attributes a task has, and the more intense these attributes are, the less attractive the task will be to you, and the more likely you'll procrastinate on it. Chris goes on to share some examples of how, armed with this knowledge, when you recognise that a task you're procrastinating on has one or more of these attributes, uh, how you can change the task or change the uh, setting to avoid or dampen down the procrastination. In other words, by making the task more attractive. So if the task is boring, I might go to my favourite cafe for an afternoon on Saturday to do the task over a fancy drink while doing some people watching. If the task is frustrating, I bring a book to the same cafe and set a timer on my phone to limit myself working on the task to just 30 minutes and only work on it for longer if I feel I'm on a roll and feel like going on. If the task is difficult, I research the task process to see what steps I need to follow and I visit the cafe during my biological prime time, when I'll naturally have more energy. And we'll talk a little bit about, um, a a bit more about that, that concept of biological prime time in the episode next week. If the task is unstructured or ambiguous, I'll make a very detailed plan from my research that has the very next steps I need to do. In other words, I'll break the big task down into smaller concrete steps. If the task is lacking in personal meaning, try and find ways to create personal meaning. So he uses the example of doing his taxes. If I expect to get a refund, think about how much money I will get back and make a list of the meaningful things I'll spend that money on. If you're revising for your exams, studying for your exams, think about even if the subject itself doesn't feel like it has a lot of personal meaning, you don't feel like you're going to have a lot of use for your uh, calculus studies for the rest of your life, um, then at least think about what the outcome of that test or exam is going to mean for you, being able to advance to your preferred college or university, or being able to land a really plum job. And then finally, number six on this list, if a task is lacking in intrinsic rewards, for every 15 minutes I spend doing the task, again, he's using his example of doing his taxes, I set aside $2.50 to treat myself or reward myself in some meaningful way for reaching milestones. In other words, if there's no intrinsic reward, uh, finding a source of extrinsic or external reward, that $2.50, paying yourself effectively uh, to do the task. So that wraps up five of my uh, favourite picks across a range of different aspects of studying and learning more effectively. Uh, We had Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning, 
We had Understanding How We Learn. We had Redirect by Timothy Wilson, Changing the Stories We Live By. We had Switch by Chip and Dan Heath, How to Change Things When Change is Hard. And we wrapped things up with The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey, How to Accomplish More by Managing Your Time, Attention and Energy. By the way, if you'd like to find out more about any of the books we've talked about today and maybe even treat yourself to a copy or two for your own bookshelves, I've put links to them all for you in the show notes. The five I chose today were actually shortlisted from a longer list of all 21 of my absolute favourite books about studying and learning. And these 21 are the books that sit on that special shelf just behind my desk, you know, organised by colour, as I mentioned back at the start. If you want to see what's on the full list, just Google exam study expert books and that article should pop up for you. As always, if you do have any questions about your studies uh, and how to work efficiently, feel free to get in touch. You can either find the contact form on the website at examstudyexpert.com or just email me directly. It's William at examstudyexpert.com. Thanks again for listening, and I look forward to seeing you next time. And as I say, introducing you to the wonderful Chris Bailey, who'll be here to help us get productive. In other words, to get quality work done in record time. In other words, freeing up as much of your valuable time as possible for you to spend how you want. It's going to be a great episode, and I can't wait to share it with you next week. Until then, wishing you every success in your studies. Just before you go... Did you know you can hire William as your very own coach and mentor to show you the stress-free way to ace your exams by studying smarter, not harder? Find out how at examstudyexpert.com slash coaching.